Right, we're moving ahead to capacitors and circuits. And our first thing that we get to talk about there is capacitors. Now, I know this seems like a lot, but it really isn't. Um, this will be our first slide. It won't take very long. This will be our second slide and we're going to third slide down here. This is all pretty simple. It's how does a capacitor work? Sorry, what is capacitance? How does capacitance work? How do I get energy in a capacitor? What's a parallel plate capacitor look like? And then a quick note on cylindrical and spherical capacitors. Once you see everything come together, hopefully this stuff and this stuff about spherical capacitors should make some sense. So, jumping in, capacitance. Capacitance is... Um, Storing electrical energy across a voltage. Um, capacitance is the definition of a static situation. Basically, capacitance is what we get when we um, when we separate positive and negative charges. Um, our simplest case, and we'll be talking about this a good a good bit. Let's say I have a plate that's plus Q, and a plate below that that's minus Q. Now, looking at that, we know there's an electric field that points from positive to negative. And in just a second, we'll talk about how we know that that electric field is constant. So we have a constant electric field, and these things are separated by a distance of uh, d we know that there's a voltage there. So anytime we separate charges, we automatically create a voltage and we're storing energy across it. So capacitance being its own little thing, C is going to be um, charge divided by voltage. C is Q over V, okay? Uh, and the unit for capacitance is a farad. So a farad, named after Michael Faraday, is charge in coulombs per volts. Just as far as the units go. We'll write that down. F A R A D. So when we say capacitance, we mean this separating charges over voltage. That's storing energy across a voltage, specifically storing electrical energy. Um, common uses for capacitors, and I don't know if we're going to get to talk about this a lot, but they have. Uh, we use them when we're rectifying circuits to filter out frequencies. Um, if you've ever bought a quote, base blocker for for your car, if you have a tweeter and you're trying to get rid of the low frequency sounds, use a capacitor to do that. Um, they can also just store massive amounts of energy. Um, Grant has an idea for a railgun that shoots an egg. We would be using capacitors to store that energy. So. The basics of capacitance is this. This is how we will calculate capacitance in general. When we put capacitors in circuits, we'll use this formula. That's a very, very important one. Now, energy. Energy and capacitance um, is quite simple. I know that work is Q times V. Well, for a capacitor, we're going to be adding and adding and adding a tiny bit of charge every time. So we're talking about differential work being equal to V times dQ. Well, I know that from this, voltage is equal to Q over C. So, so my differential bit of work is going to be Q over C times dQ. So to get the work, we'd integrate both sides. We'd go from zero to the total amount of work it takes to put all those charges on there. And we'd go from zero to the total amount of charge that we put on our capacitor, Q. So that tells me work is equal to, well, if I take the integral of Q, just Q, that's one half, apply my limits, Q squared over C. So the energy stored in a capacitor, energy, is one-half the charge on that capacitor squared over the capacitance. 
And if I plug in C equals Q over V, I could also say that energy is equal to um, one half CV squared. There are multiple ways to write it. Uh, we're going to go with this one most of the time because it fits what we've said before for energy, but anything that you do for that is valid. And it's not terribly important that you know where this comes from. It's important that you know this is what the energy of a capacitor is. So the next thing we're going to do is look at a parallel plate capacitor and see how we can get the capacitance of that. So parallel plate capacitor, I have a sheet. It's not infinitely long, but it's pretty long. Um, and it extends back into the page. It has an area, we'll call that area A. One sheet, and then below that, another sheet. Two parallel plates. They both have the same area A. And on the top, we're going to put plus Q. On the bottom, we're going to put minus Q. Which means that the top plate has sigma equal to plus Q over A, and the bottom one has negative sigma, which is equal to negative Q over A. Uh, that's, that's good to keep, keep in mind. So I'm going to redraw it just as a front view, where I have plus sigma up here, and I've got negative sigma down here. In order to calculate the capacitance, just keeping in mind, capacitance is equal to the charge on the capacitor divided by the voltage separating. Now, they're separated by here, we'll call it a distance of D. So again, separated by a distance of D. Now, the charge, I'm not going to add these two together, it's the charge on one plate or the other. Um, in a conducting situation, this is actually going to induce this charge over here. We don't have to talk about where it comes from yet, but one charge goes there when we calculate capacitance. In order to calculate capacitance, we need the voltage of this system. Well, I, I know I know that voltage is equal to the integral of the electric field uh, dotted with R, the opposite of that. So what I need first is an expression for the electric field. Thank goodness we just got done doing Gauss's law. So I can find the electric field here. And in fact, a parallel plate capacitor was on that last test we took. So if we look at this, let's just look at what's going on on the outside first. If I draw my Gaussian surface here, area A on the top, area A on the bottom, and I look at that, E dot DA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Well, if we look at the Q enclosed, I have plus sigma times A and minus sigma times A enclosed in this thing. Telling me that the electric field at the location of the top and the bottom is zero. The electric field outside of a parallel plate capacitor is zero. Good to know. I'll say it again so maybe you'll write it down. The electric field outside of a parallel plate capacitor is zero. That's an important thing. So we'll call this outside. Inside, in fact, we will use the brown color for that. Inside, if we do it, we can choose the top or the bottom. I'm going to go with the top. We put our Gaussian surface right there on the inside. I again have E dot DA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Well, for this, again, looking at it, I'm, I'm an equal distance away here. I know my electric field, I'll do that in green, I know my electric field points from top to bottom. And because of the arrangement of charges, it looks like it's going to be pretty constant, which is great. So I can pull it out of the area. So I have E times A is equal to sigma A over epsilon naught. Well, E times A, that goes away, that goes away. My electric field is equal to sigma over epsilon naught. And my electric field, if you'll notice, 
doesn't change as a function. I could have made that box bigger. I could have chose the bottom. Turns out that the electric field on the inside is constant. Now if we want to write that in terms of what we had up here, we could also say that the electric field is equal to, if sigma is Q over A, Q over A epsilon naught. This will be my electric field on the inside and it's constant. That's good to know, the constant part of this. So if we look at our voltage over here, and we want to try, because ultimately we're trying to find the capacitance. If we look at the voltage over here, well, I just said the electric field was constant. And that distance, well, so it's E times the integral of dr. And again, capacitance doesn't really have a sign to it, so I'm not terribly concerned with that negative sign. Well, the distance separating my plates is what I'd integrate over. That's the only place that I have the electric field. So as I integrate here, dr is just d. So my voltage would just be e times that distance because it's all constant. Well, that's great. Looking then at what we have for e, it's, it's just q times d over a epsilon naught. That's my voltage. So if I want the capacitance of this parallel plate capacitor, it's Q over V. Well, that's Q over QD over A epsilon naught. When my Qs go away, A epsilon naught goes to the top. And my capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor is the area of the plate times that fundamental constant epsilon naught divided by the distance separating those plates. Fantastic. That's a very simple formula. I don't always remember this off the top of my head, so often when I'm solving problems for class, I have to go through this really quickly to look at how things change. And it's good to know this because I'm gonna, we're going to start looking at issues with changing the electric field in there. But for now, it's very simple. If I increase this area, I increase the capacitance. If I decrease how far apart those two things are, I increase the capacitance. If I pull them farther apart, I decrease the capacitance. But notice that the capacitance here has nothing to do with the actual charge there, just the construction of the capacitor. It's a, it's a very important thing. Now, the reason the capacitance decreases as these things get farther and farther apart is because as this gets farther and farther apart, the voltage increases. It's charge per unit voltage. So even though I'm increasing the voltage, it's not as hard to keep those two charges apart, this plus and this minus apart when they're farther away. Um, and, and, and we'll play with this a lot more. One of the things the AP test likes to do is asks you, if I change one of these things, what does it do to the other one? That's capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor. We will spend 95% of our time talking about capacitors, talking about a parallel plate capacitor. The case of a spherical or a cylindrical capacitor is very, very easy um, and straightforward. Essentially, for a spherical or a cylindrical capacitor, the cross section of each, I have to draw a circle with this thing, um, the cross section of each is essentially the same. If it were a cylinder, it would just continue out like this, and for a sphere, it would look like this. I'd have a positive charge here, and that would induce a negative charge here. And all I care about for my capacitor is this area in the middle. Well, we know how to find the electric field here. Um, for a sphere, it's, it's well, e dot dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So for a sphere, it's um, in the middle. The electric field is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And the electric field for a very long cylinder, which you should know, if it has a very long cylinder, is uh, lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught r. 
or in terms of Q and, and a capacitor of a given length L, um, it would be equal to Q over the length of the capacitor times 2 pi epsilon naught R. Pretty straightforward. You can look through your notes again to see how that would work. Um, so the voltage here would be the integral of this electric field, which is not constant, which makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, and we, if we say this radius is B and this one is A, from B to A. We don't care about anything else. That's Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared dr. So that voltage would be Q over 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 over A minus 1 over B. That's the voltage there. The voltage here is a little bit trickier. There's a natural log in there. But again, it's the same integral from B to A of Q over the length, I'll do a capital L, times 2 pi epsilon naught R dr. So the voltage here comes out to be Q over L times 2 pi epsilon naught R uh, times the natural log of B over A. That's all the negative signs considered. Here the negative signs matter because of that natural law. And here the negative signs matter. So, getting the capacitance, capacitance for a sphere is Q over V, Q over Q times 4 pi epsilon naught 1 over A minus 1 over B. Qs go away. Again, telling us it does not depend on the actual charge there, just the construction, 4 pi epsilon naught all constant, A and B are properties of how this thing is put together, right? So that's 4 pi epsilon naught over 1 over A minus 1 over B. If you want to get fancy, it would be B minus A times 4 pi epsilon naught over AB. It's a lot of math. I went really fast. You can follow it on your own. And then over here, um, in brown, the capacitance here would be Q over that voltage, Q over L times 2 pi epsilon naught R times the natural log of B over A. Q's cross out, and again, the capacitance doesn't depend on the actual charge there, just the construction of my thing, and that's equal to L times 2 pi epsilon naught R over the natural log of B over A. Um, those are the basics of capacitance. We, we will do a worksheet, kind of works on some of the finer points here, but that's the basics of capacitance.